I'm a doctor, but I can't think clearly anymore, so I can't do my job. Long COVID causes debilitating cognitive issues. I'm a runner, but now I can't walk 100 feet without getting exhausted. Long COVID causes crippling fatigue that may last a lifetime. I've lost friendships because of long COVID. I just don't feel well enough to see people. People may look outwardly healthy, but they're suffering from a physical disorder that can upend lives. Everything hurts. I can't even go out and play. Up to 30% of COVID patients develop long COVID. And right now, there's no cure and little understanding. I can't focus. I can't think straight. I can't keep a job. So for those suffering daily, there's just one urgent question. How long? How long? How long? How long? Until we solve long COVID. The Solve Long COVID initiative is bringing together patients, researchers, doctors, and drug developers to find answers now. To learn more and see how you can help, go to solvelongcovid.org. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Jill Fernito, Executive Director of the Global Interdependence Center. On behalf of the GIC and the Solve Long COVID Initiative, welcome to today's executive briefing. Today's executive briefing is a continuation of the program series designed by the GIC and Solve Long COVID Initiative entitled Long COVID Research, Policy, and Economic Impact. We have just viewed the public service announcement recently produced by the Solve Long COVID Initiative and are glad to have shared it with this audience. Throughout 2022, GIC and Solve have connected world-class immunologists, medical experts, policymakers, and economists to explore critical insights into defining, diagnosing, optimizing treatments, and healthcare policies for long COVID and analyzing its impact on the U.S. and global label markets. I would like to extend our sincere appreciation to the Solve Long COVID Initiative and to David Kotak, longtime board member and supporter of the GIC, for providing the sponsorship support for our Long COVID program series. At this time, I'm pleased to introduce our recorded keynote presentation by Megan O'Rourke, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Invisible Kingdom, Reimagining Chronic Illness. After which, you will hear from our moderator, Emily Taylor, Vice President of Advocacy and Engagement at Solve ME. It's wonderful to be here um, on this panel speaking to everyone. I'm so grateful to you all for inviting me and giving me this chance to talk. The particular challenges are pretty um, manifold, right? On the one hand, there is this pre-existing history of bias and um, dismissal toward patients with ME-CFS, chronic Lyme, even fibromyalgia, and now even long COVID we've seen, right? Um, and that bias emerges out of the fact that, about many facts, but one of them being that some of these diseases are, we haven't studied very deeply, and they're hard, as we know, to measure using conventional kind of surface level tools of medicine. And so medicine is left with trying to think about people whose bodies live at the edge of medical knowledge and historically medicine has done a terrible job of that. But too often the media coverage of these illnesses doesn't even acknowledge that systemic structural reality that shapes the entire way that we think about how science and, and you know, clinicians um, from, from the abstract to the kind of on the ground treat patients with ME-CFS, treat patients with long COVID, treat in every sense of the word, right, in terms of affect and actual care. So I think that the first thing that the media needs to do is that the person writing about these conditions has to have a really inform themselves about the deeper structural realities that have shaped um, not only what medicine knows and doesn't know about these conditions, but patients' own experiences. And that will help journalists have an understanding of why patient frustration exists that I find sometimes startlingly absent in pieces that I read. So I noticed a couple of problems that crop up over and over in pieces about ME-CFS, Lyme disease, long COVID, and the list goes on, right? Um, and one of those problems is that there's this often this implicit and uninterrogated or unexamined impulse to equate advocacy with being anti-science. And one of the things that I said recently in a Twitter thread I wrote about the recent New York Magazine piece in which Emily is quoted um, about ME-CFS and long COVID was that that piece treated advocacy as though 
it, it were a dirty word, right? There was a moment where it said, you know, some scientists were frustrated that advocacy had won. And what was really meant was that, you know, anti-science had won, right? But none of that was quite brought to the surface. So there was this way in which the piece and many pieces like it often set up a straw, what we call a straw man as, as a journalist and an editor, I'm taught not to set up straw men. And pieces that I see in the media constantly set up straw men. So the straw man is, advocates are angry, so therefore they are irrational and, you know, anti-science. And one of the things that I tried to convey in my piece is that, A, there's a long history of media um, painting advocates and patients as irrational, um, not just in MECFS or long COVID, but when we look at the history of HIV AIDS, right? The other point that I think the media often misses is that patients more than anyone want science and really good science. What patients are frustrated by is bad science, lack of funding, poorly designed trials, you know, um, the kind of wild absence of intellectual curiosity about these diseases that leads to kind of the same old recycled ideas about psychology cropping up over and over. So that's one kind of problem I see. I see another kind of problem over and over, which is that often, um, the patients or the people living with disease who are selected as representatives are either in some way extreme and at an extreme edge, which is to say they may present as being especially irrational, right? They may reject certain tenets of basic science, as opposed to the journalist selecting what I think is a much larger group of people, patient advocates who believe in science and just want better science, right? So I've seen that. Also, we see sometimes patients selected who don't have very extreme versions of the disease in the sense that they're not that sick. So you get in the media a portrait of people who are mildly ill. Um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I really struggled with when I was writing The Invisible Kingdom is how do we as writers make chronic illness that is characterized by um, poorly characterized symptoms, so to speak, like brain fog, like fatigue, how do we make that dramatic and distinct on the page, right? When we don't even yet have the full vocabulary for what's happening in the body. Um, and one way I tried to do that was really by slowing down and trying to explain to the reader in a kind of blow by blow way what this was really like. And all too often, I just don't see that effort of of imagining patients' reality, of listening to patients being made. So one of the chief things the media needs to do is deeply listen to patients, hear the, dr the drama in what they're saying, hear the severity in what they're saying, and get that on the page. Another thing I want to add is that often these pieces do, you know, what I, what I call funny things with gender, which is to say that they'll often include a quote from saying, well, you know, most of the people who have these diseases are women and they're middle class and they're white. Again, in in order to imply that this is part of a larger tradition that goes back to hysteria and is, you know, included in somatoform disorder. So all in the service of implying that there's something psychological here being driven by a very particular kind of person who is privileged, um, white and middle aged and a woman. And it's, it's pretty clearly implicitly trading in misogyny, right? And it's again often very an uninterrogated, a very similar moment happened in the recent New York Magazine piece. And any journalist worth their salt should see that statement and quote and do some of their own digging because as soon as you start to dig, you find that the picture is much more complicated, but that often, um, you know, people of color aren't getting care they need, people in rural areas aren't getting the care they need. Um, and also that there are scientific reasons why women might suffer from autoimmune diseases more often than men. We know that's the case. So there may be scientific factors driving the fact that we're seeing more um, women as long COVID patients, for example. So there's, you know, real science to dig into there that's often left on the table. I think it has been a legitimizing force and that it has raised awareness one thing we know is that clearly there's a lot of funding, right? Compared to, I think, MECFS at certain points, compared to Lyme at many points, there's 
just a lot of funding. That's not to say there shouldn't be more, but there's but there's money and there's attention. Um, the scope of the problem of long COVID has definitely shined a light on this broader problem of infection associated complex illness. That's not to say that there's not a lot more work to be done, there is, but I think in addition to shining a light on it, it's offering this really concrete benefit, which is that um, there was a lot of bad science done around Lyme disease where they, you know, scientists would look at the prevalence of symptoms in Lyme patients and say, oh, you know, actually the general population also has aches and pains and also experiences fatigue. And one of the things I've noticed in long COVID research is that there'll be findings that say, oh, you know, the general population also has these, but then the researchers keep digging and find out ways to differentiate and to show, but, but our patients also have these five other symptoms, right, that go beyond fatigue, that go beyond brain fog and their prevalence is higher. And so there's much more intellectual curiosity and kind of ferment around, you know, what is driving these conditions than I think there was certainly 20, 30, 40 years ago. I think it's totally understandable and human to feel this way. I feel a little pang of it too, as as a person with you know complicated tick-borne illness. Um, but I do think that over time, that it's not that it's a trickle-down economy, but that in fact there are these overlapping mechanisms, right? That as I was just saying, are going to help shine a light more broadly on on all of these conditions. And I also think put templates in place for better science to be done that really will benefit us. The other thing I would say quite simply is that we, we, you know, scientists think there may be some overlap between one, these, some of these conditions or susceptibility to some of them, right? If you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, you may be more susceptible to POTS, et cetera. And speaking for myself, I can say I have long COVID now, right? I got COVID this summer for the first time and I have long COVID and it's distinct from my tick-borne illness. Um, but my tick-borne illness probably paved the way for me to be more susceptible or something about what made me susceptible to not getting over tick-borne illness is part of why I'm not getting over COVID. So in the end, I am grateful for, and I hope that we can all find a way to kind of keep using our voices to say we still need research into these other conditions, right? Um, but to see this hopefully as the the tide that's right, you know, lifting all boats, I hope. But I think that's going to require us continuing to lift our voices about all of them. Thank you so much, um, Jill, and thank you to Megan for that amazing keynote address and um, for that warm welcome. It's such a joy working with you and the GIC team. It's my pleasure now to welcome our panelists, Cynthia Adenig, Fiona Lowenstein, and Sandhya Kambahapati. Um, thank you again for joining us. It's, uh, it, it's just time for a, a quick introduction from each of you. Um, first, it's my pleasure to introduce Cynthia Adenig. Cynthia is an MECFS uh, and long COVID patient advocate and a member of Solve ME's board of directors. As a long COVID patient, Cynthia has testified before Congress on the need for long COVID support and has been featured in multiple national news media and has been asked to speak at international conferences in this capacity. She's also the creator of a digital guide for medical care for long haulers of color. Welcome, Cynthia. I'm looking forward to your remarks. Thanks for having me, Emily. Um, wow, there was so much to unpack with that presentation. It really hit so many things that I felt but couldn't put into words. And um, for those who don't know my story, I got long COVID back in March, 2020. I experienced a rare, more rare, um, severe level of food reactions um, since getting long COVID, which basically means that I am now allergic to all food and water. Um, and that took a long time for medical care to, to, to catch up to you. So it, led to me almost dying multiple times from starvation in those related incidences. And um, I, of course, I have worked on different legislation to make sure that some of these associated illnesses, like the one that I experienced and others with long COVID, um, get included into, um, into funding and research so that it over 
overall is going to help even those who don't have long COVID. And I'm really thankful that we're having this conversation about media um, because you know there is, has been a disparity with MECFS and other post-viral illnesses, uh, post-infection illnesses, of having voices of color, uh, especially women of color, being included in these conversations. So um, I'm glad to be here on behalf to to speak to my my experience with that and and discuss. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Excited to continue the conversation with you. Um, next, I'd love to have Fiona Lowenstein introduce herself. Fiona, um, it, welcome. Uh, as a founder of Body Politic and an award-winning journalist, producer, speaker, um, and queer feminist wellness uh, and founder of Body Politic, a queer feminist wellness protect collective, um, and of course, a media organization that is now um, a patient-led long COVID advocacy group. Um, Fiona or Fee was hospitalizing co for COVID in March 2020 and went on to found Body Politic, the COVID-19 support group, which offers support and resources to over 11,000 people living with long COVID and COVID-19 around the world. Um, their work has been published in the New York Times, Fox, Teen Vogue, Business Insider, The Guardian, I could go on and on, and they are the editor of the Long COVID Survival Guide, How to Take Care of Yourself and What Comes Next. Fiona or Fee, thank you so much for joining us. I'd love to hear your remarks as well. Thanks for thanks for having me here. Um, it's this is a topic I'm definitely very passionate about. I started uh, writing about my experience with um, at the time I was not calling it long COVID. We we were not calling it long COVID um, uh, back in I guess uh, early April of 2020. Um, in in what seems to now sort of be the first mainstream media account of what we now refer to as long COVID. Um, I had connected with other patients online who were similarly not recovering quickly from their COVID infection. Um, and I, you know, I think largely, you know, as a result of being a white economically privileged patient with access to a primary care provider was able to get that positive COVID test was able to be hospitalized when I uh, really, you know, had that severe case um, in March of 2020. And so that that made it so that I was believed when I talked about my long-term symptoms. Um, and that made it so that um, I kind of was able to use my platform as a journalist to share my own story, but also share the stories of others. Um, and so that was what I dedicated a lot of time to in those early months, um, as well as, of course, forming the Body Politic Support Group, which I no longer run. It is now run by the amazing uh, long COVID activist, Angela Vasquez. Um, would definitely recommend checking her out. Um, she is, it's Ange in LA on Twitter if you don't follow her already. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of how I got involved in the movement. And um, I would say my role from there has very much remained kind of trying to chronicle this movement, trying to amplify other long haulers voices, and then most recently creating this guide that you can see behind me on the bookshelf um, to really try and summarize the information that we gathered in these support groups um, and, you know, on websites like Twitter um, in those early days and kind of through the past two years. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to hearing more about your thoughts, especially hearing more from your book. Um, so excited. And last but most certainly not least, we'll hear from Sandhya Kambapati. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to keep mispronouncing your name. Could you could you make sure I'm doing it correctly? <laughs> Kambapati. Kambapati. I'm sorry about that. Uh, it's so great to have you. Um, Sandia is a data reporter on the Los Angeles Times Data Desk, where she covers the demographics and diversity of California and the nation. At the LA Times, she is working on a series of stories to understand the experience of long haul COVID-19 folks and their caregivers and how they're navigating the medical, financial, mental, and emotional challenges of having chronic illness in California. Sandia, welcome so much. Um, I'd love to hear your remarks and your thoughts about the keynote. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, uh, I, I just want to say that, I mean, I echo everything that Megan said. I think she said it way more succinctly than I could have, but um, I will say that um, I, um, at the LA Times, I am uh, covering long COVID. Um, I have long COVID as well. I wrote about it in the LA Times back in uh, August of 2021. So similar to Fiona, I was one of the people that got sick early on in the pandemic. However, um, I did not get the care I needed until way later than I expected. So um, as a result of that, I really didn't write about my experience, um, mostly because I didn't even know that it was a thing um, until really 2021. Um, and uh, uh, since writing my piece about my experience, I've heard from lots of people of color, 
uh, throughout California and the country, um, you know, saying they've had very similar experiences. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to write about their experiences and the nuances about, you know, navigating the medical and financial systems that exist and the barriers that ex that are already pre-existed before, before COVID um, and are just being amplified even more. Um, and so hoping to, uh, you know, really shed light on those issues and, and help others, uh, you know, understand this complex disease. Fantastic. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for joining us. And I, I'm going to send the first question your direction. I hope that's okay. Um, so we're just going to dive right in and get started with um, with uh, our Q&A. And just mention that we are welcoming questions from the audience. So if you are um, interested in sending a question to our panel, you can use the questions tab on your dashboard and type in a question in that Q&A box. Um, so let's get started. Um, I, I would love to start with what are the particular challenges for the media in covering long COVID and other complex chronic illnesses? Are there challenges that are unique to long COVID that are different than previous similar illnesses like ME-CFS or Lyme? Or, um, is, or has long COVID brought a unique challenge to the coverage? Um, or has it just been a, ch a challenge from the beginning um, to cover these illnesses? I'd love to hear your thoughts and um, any unique ideas about what long COVID has changed about the challenges of covering these illnesses. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump in. I'm, I um, I I think that um, the you know long COVID has really uh, um, highlighted the the need for for making sure we understand how to reach broader audiences. I think that there is a a deep need for that, and um, the the issue is is that there's it's not as straightforward. You know these are complex illnesses, and I don't think it's so straightforward to just have one person represent the voice for for all. And I think that's the difficulty is um, the same people are often quoted over and over again. And it's frustrating to see that from a patient point, viewpoint, but also from a reporter standpoint. Um, and just as a aside, I will say that um, I cover, I usually uh, do data and statistical analysis and graphics. And so for me, um, what I always try to keep in mind is, you know, there, there are people behind all of the numbers and, and the numbers that we report, um, you know, they're changing every minute, every second, every day. And so it's, it's, I think for me, that's been the difficult part is just understanding the, the breadth of just how how many people are affected by this and making sure we don't put numbers out there that aren't misleading um and i don't think that's a new thing uh i think that that is something that's that's always been there and always want to make sure you put the right information forward but um but yeah i will pass it to the other panelists well yeah, Fee, if you'd like to take a stab at that one, um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how um, long COVID has either changed or created new challenges for covering these illnesses, or was it just the same challenges were just repackaged in a, in a new uh, new year? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think many of the, the challenges remain, right? Many of the challenges with covering uh, illnesses that have not been adequately researched remain. And I think Julie Raymeyer, uh, who is uh, someone living with MECFS, who's also a journalist, has done a lot of excellent work, as well as obviously Megan O'Rourke on kind of demonstrating the double bind that that journalists, you know, find themselves in when you're essentially trying to report on a disease that, you know, there isn't enough existing research on. And, and I say this, of course, with the knowledge that there also is a lot of good research, uh, you know, very much showing that MECFS and long COVID are, for example, not psychosomatic. Uh, illnesses. Um, but that that's very difficult, right? Trying to kind of report on illnesses that have have not received the, the funded research that they should um, and that there are stigmas surrounding. Um, so I think that remains. I do think there are added challenges reporting on COVID. And then there are also some, some things that have perhaps gotten easier. So I think um, in many ways, you know, the focus on long COVID has illuminated some of the reporting challenges for MECFS. And I think there is a greater awareness right now among journalists, um, you know, not to fall into those same, you know, traps that maybe they fell into before when covering MECFS, um, to understand that, you know, just because there, there isn't necessarily a very clear biomarker uh, across all cases of ME-CFS or all cases of long COVID that, you know, this is a psychological illness. Um, 
So I think I think that you know is something that's helpful. But on the other hand, um, COVID has been a highly politicized disease from the very beginning, and that means that sources um, who we speak to as journalists are putting themselves at greater risk um, in in speaking to us and sharing their stories. Um, I think most of us who have been public about our experiences with both COVID and long COVID have experienced a fair amount of online harassment, um, and uh, you know both both from like random internet trolls and and in the form of you know i i started an organization that was try you know someone tried to tear apart body politic in a semi-homophobic wall street journal op-ed so that you know that was a surprising thing that happened at one point so it's kind of coming from from all angles right because this is a politicized disease and people have a lot of thoughts on it um and people were forced to make sacrifices you know during the pandemic and so there's there's anger that comes out um and then finally i think um another thing that sets it apart is that a lot of the advocacy efforts that were set up around long COVID, you know, things like uh, the COVID-19 Long Hauler Advocacy Project and Body Politic um, were set up very much as crisis responses. And so, you know, a lot of the MECFS organizations we have, again, of course, set up as a crisis response, but over longer periods of time and not necessarily in the face of a mass disabling event where everyone involved has just become sick for kind of the first time. And so that defines the advocacy efforts. It also is a defining aspect of reporting on this because you're talking to advocates who are very much kind of in that crisis response mode. So I think in some ways that might um, you know, be a similarity or a parallel between reporting on long COVID and reporting on the HIV AIDS crisis when it first emerged. In the in the late 70s, 80s, 90s, um, but I think that is something that sets it apart a little bit from you know reporting on uh, Lyme and MECFS and and other complex um, infection associated chronic illnesses uh, prior to the pandemic. Wow, th thank you for those some fascinating insights. I didn't really think about how, um, and, and that's sort of just making my mind uh, bubble with excitement about how the the re crisis reporting is like, a mid crisis as opposed to kind of building a longer term narrative, which is what a lot of the advocacy efforts prior to the pandemic and these complex chronic illnesses had been attempting to do. That is fascinating. I'm going to have to sit and ruminate on that for a while, but we don't have time for that. I'm going to pass it over to Cynthia. Cynthia, what do you think are some of the tripwires or um, challenges that a journalist has faced? and have those tripwires or challenges evolved um, in the, the recent pandemic? Yeah, um, I feel like because this is happening during a pandemic, it has changed so much of the template to even interviewing. Um, you know, me having the ability to interview via Zoom has been great and allowed me to do way more interviews than I would have ever been able to do. And also, I've, I've watched journalists come educated now. When I was first getting interviewed, they didn't understand um, you know, the cognitive weight of an interview for patients or the, le the issues with mobility or that I may need to cancel like that morning of because I'm in the ER. In fact, uh, that happened with, with the Washington, one of the Washington Post interviews that, uh, that I did. Um, I was like, but I'm feeling I'm going to end up in the ER, so we, can we push this back? And I end up in the ER. So um, I, I'm definitely seeing the way that they are even setting up how to complete an interview is way, um, it's, it's just more intentional about our potential realities. And um, I'm really appreciative that, that that happened. But then also, because we are in the pandemic, source and because long COVID continues to develop and some symptoms are vague and not tangible currently that sets up for people who don't have long COVID to be able to give interviews as if they do and it really makes it difficult for a for a journalist to verify that that person actually has long COVID so that really isn't one of the things that I've seen happening. So it's, it's very unique to the space, you know, pre pandemic, you could really go to hospitals and source out and talk to doctors and, and do find out more backstory on, on people. But because it was so new and so urgent and such a hot topic, um, there's some differences. 
Absolutely. Um, well, so speaking of kind of those differences, um, at Fee, you touched on this earlier. I'd like to jump back to this point. Um, th this is a question that um, came from our, our pre-submitted audience before the panel. Um, how can journalists best represent conditions about which so little is understood? And we sort of touched on how challenging it is to um, to present information when the science is is, is still, you know, developing. Um, so what is sort of the counter to that? If we're, if we're lacking information, how can a journalist present information or present the lack of information in a way that's uh, that's uh, representing the patient community well? I guess what how do how do I guess how does a journalist navigate that challenge is, is the question. Uh, Fee, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, I think step one is kind of trying to investigate why there's a lack of information, right? So in some cases, it could be that it's a novel virus, right? It just showed up. And so, you know, okay, we don't we don't fully understand this because, you know, COVID just appeared. And, and so we don't have all the answers. But in this case, that wouldn't be the full the full kind of extent of your investigation, because as we understand um, a lack of research into related illnesses is also has also resulted in us not having enough answers on long COVID. Um, and so then you you have to ask yourself, well, why why hasn't there been more research into, you know, other related um, infection associated illnesses like ME-CFS? And so then you might find yourself kind of going down the road of, well, who who have these illnesses, you know, predominantly impacted, you know, what what sorts of patients um, and, you know, the the gender burden that uh, that Megan O'Rourke referenced, right? And looking at kind of the, the long history of, you know, you know, you might find yourself reading Maya Dusenberry's book, Doing Harm, and kind of looking at um, how how funding has been allocated to different to research into different diseases and and how gender plays a part in that and and race and and other equity issues, right? Um, so I think that's kind of the first question um, there, to so that you're not just saying there's a lack of research, but you're you're explaining why and contextualizing that. And then I think the the other important thing to do is to really center patient experiences, um, you know, uh, in terms of both symptoms, but the experiences people are having navigating healthcare systems, you know, unfortunately, research progressing doesn't necessarily change those experiences for patients. And so that's a story that's going to remain relevant for, for a while. Um, and then finally, obviously, I think it's important to talk to the researchers who are trying to push research forward, understanding that, um, you know, research, the people that are pushing research forward are researchers. They're often researchers with lived experience, right? We have patient researchers that are working on long COVID. We also have advocates and, you know, people like Cynthia who are very much involved in that research, you know, in an advisory capacity. And so talking to those patients and understanding the long history that, you know, again, from my understanding, did, did very much sort of begin with uh, HIV AIDS advocacy of patients having that meaningful involvement in setting research agendas and determining research agendas. And, and so then, you know, that's a story as well, right? Well, is that happening here? Are patients being able to kind of, you know, be involved in setting research agendas and determining what research outcomes, you know, should be prioritized? Or is that not happening here? And if it's not happening, is that going to perhaps delay the research outcomes that patients want? You know, are the research outcomes that are being pursued perhaps not aligned with the research outcomes that patients actually want to be pursued? I think there's a lot of different interesting stories that can be written, even while research is still emerging. And what a fascinating webinar that could be to just explore the role of media and research involvement and see how those ideas interplay. And I, we could fall down that rabbit hole. Um, Sandhya, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that same question, especially um, from your role at the data desk. This is a challenge I imagine you face every day. So um, how do you navigate that that particular challenge of having that, that, that question of um, where the science falls short and then where do you go with the representation from there? Yeah, I think that's a... I think it's a really important question. And I think that um, it's difficult. Um, I, I don't, I, I wish I had like the full, uh, what is it, the, the, the full answer here <laughs> for it. Um, I, I don't think there is like one particular thing that I could point to and say like, that's for sure the, the answer. Um, but what I can say is that having healthy skepticism, I think is really important as a journalist, just in general, but especially with dealing with research. Um, you know, looking at the um, uh, the the pool of people that they that they actually interviewed um, to do the research to understand how big the pool was, the sample size, what people are represented in the sample size. Like, is it all uh, women of uh, white descent or is it all women that are black? Um, understanding the nuances of who actually makes up the research pool is super important. And and explaining that in the story too. Um, I think that like, we have to explain that like research has limitations and we, we as journalists know that. And 
you know, you, you know that, um, but, you know, and it's evolving every day. And so we can only use, we can use what, what's available to us, but at the same time, we need to be, uh, understand and really make sure we lay out those limitations in our inner pieces and, and not just, um, uh, you know, uh, leave those, leave those details out. I often look at footnotes as well as, um, uh, the tiny print that's on the bottom of these research papers. I think that that is often um, the where the real gold lies and um, really where where um, the stories are. Um, I also think it's important to, of course, talk to the researchers, but understand why they did the research and understand um, what what um, what area they were coming from when they kind of created the research in the first place or, or started looking into a certain thing. Um, and I think that applies across the board, not just for long COVID. I think that applies for any research, any data analysis in general um, is really just to be uh, skeptical and ask lots of questions. Um, one thing I will say that I, I um, not to skip back, but to, to reiterate something that I uh, escaped my mind earlier um, is that um, I think it's important to just um, uh, you know, make sure that what's different with long COVID and the the world that we're living in now is that um, there is, like Fiona said, a lot of online harassment. And I think it's really important to, um, you know, talk to your sourcing and make sure they understand the, the downfalls or pitfalls that they might experience by, you know, reporting about them. And so, um, I, I think that's really important to underscore. And so I know that's not part of this question, but I just wanted to make sure I'd say that before it escapes my brain in the brain fog. So <laughs> no, that's, that's such a critical question. I think there's that push pull that I think I, I know I've experienced in my role, but I can imagine this is even more intense in the journalism field where you um, you want to uh, bring someone's story to light. You want to elevate an experience and, and shine a light on that experience. And yet you're shining a light on that person. And um, and so, you know, that 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 beautiful transparency is sort of the value of what that story brings. And yet that that is the innate vulnerability of somebody who brings that story. I think that's very challenging. Um, so I know in journalism, often sometimes we'll block people's faces or anonymize things like how, how do you especially with long COVID, um, and this actually will tie into a question that just came from the audience. How do you verify somebody with long COVID? How do you fact check that? And then um, and then how do you do that with a certain amount of respect or, um, or, or you know, appropriate representation? And yet, um, and yet with that skepticism, I mean, that seems like a very difficult uh, line or tightrope to walk. Uh, Cynthia, I, I'm going to throw this one on you. Um, how, so as someone who's participated in journalism, how do you navigate those waters? Yeah, I I think it's such a good question. Um, as I was saying before, like it's because it's such a vague set of symptoms, and you know, much of our experience you can't quantify on te on tests. Um, it can be really really difficult to verify. I personally, as a patient, um, am very quick to <laughs> send them my. Uh, like 200 or so pages of medical documents. Um, one, it helps me to not because to not have to rely on my own memory because it's one of the <laughs> cognitive decline is so strong, um, especially in those early days when I was in the middle of starvation, like all of June, I don't remember and it's hard for me to put into a timeline. And so I've had to like separate out like my medical files and like summaries of what, when I got diagnosed with what so that I can make sure that the um, journalist that's interviewing me is accurate or when I write about my experience, you know, now I, I write with, with Kindred, I house a lot of my experience on Kindred, um, I have to make sure that it's still maintaining consistency that I can often forget because of one, I have over 30 ER trips, so it can be hard to parse those dates. And then some of the things that I got diagnosed with, I didn't know until very recently. Um, the date of which my doctor even diagnosed me with, uh, was it post viral fatigue? I didn't even know that that was considered MECFS. And so like, it's, it's really difficult as a patient to sometimes navigate like our multiple, multiple diagnosis, nail down a date, nail down admi admissions. And so for me, what I've done is just 
sit, keep <laughs> keep a downloaded zip file <laughs> to send to reporters and let them sift through it and, and then um, try to make it as easy as possible. And I think that's, um, but also that's sensitive information and sometimes a patient, especially new to this, are not gonna feel comfortable <laughs> sending their entire medical history. And so that makes it even difficult for the journalist to fact check. It's a minefield, but um, I look forward to what Sadia and Fee have to say about this, but I know I try to be as helpful on the patient side as possible, just throw everything that they need to make their life easier. Thank you, thank you. And I, I'm so I'm so in awe of your bravery for doing that day in, day out. Uh truly, Cynthia, it's it's uh the, what you've done for the community is is there are no words. Um, but uh, to circle back to the question from the audience, um, how do you go about fact checking or proving a person has long COVID as a as from the media side of things? This is um, from somebody who's in the field and is looking for um, some insights or advice on how to uh, continue their work. Uh, Sandia, if you any any thoughts to add to that question? Sure. One way um, I've been able to you know fact check. So um, one thing I would recommend is just. Um, one, first of all, have lots of patience. I think it's really important to um, understand that uh, long COVID is a complex disease and people have brain fog and so they can't remember things. And so what I often recommend um, when I interview folks is I say, what's the best platform that you would like to talk on? Zoom, phone call, email, whatever you prefer please send me any notes you have. Um, and I actually asked them like a lot of pre-interview questions in email just so that if that's easier for them because uh, recounting it over like talking, for example, might be difficult for, for some folks or doing it over email might be easier because they can kind of add to it as they as they go on. Um, I've also asked um, in some cases to talk to the doctor as well, just so that I can get the doctor's perspective as well as the patient perspective, both sides of it. Um, I've sat in on patients' appointments. I mean, that is a level of trust that you have to gain with your patients, obviously, for them to let you into their doctor's appointments. And of course, the doctors and the hospital willing to let you in in the first place. Um, but I think that that has really been really extremely helpful for me. Um, and, and the other thing that I've used to kind of fact check is, um, you know, focusing on the finance and um, finance element of it, uh, you know, asking for bills, asking for for documentation that way. Um, because the thing is, is that we know uh, hospital billing is is often delayed and, um, you know, they might not get the documentation right away. Um, but that is helpful in, in explaining, um, you know, this person has had X amount of dollars in, in bills, um, we can actually fact check it by that by looking at that. But I think for me, um, I don't know personally. I just feel like as someone who deals with long COVID, I don't know in what world someone would want to pretend they have long COVID. Um, I know that those people exist and I'm not delegitimizing them, but I will say that like it is it is a hard thing to live with. And I just I really um, feel for those who have long COVID and other complex illnesses. And so my instinct is to trust and then, of course, verify as much as you can. But like, I I think that it's not, I, I don't know, I, I don't think there's like a hundred steps that you can take to really verify everything. I think you have to do what you can. And um, those are the steps that I would take. But I'm curious if Fiona has some other thoughts too. Yeah. Um, so I think first off, like, you know, every publication also has its own, you know, standards for fact checking. I'm freelance. So I like it's it's a different it's a different scenario in every publication. And I'm then I also personally have my own standards for what I want to do on my own. Um, the number one tip I would give is especially if you're like a staff writer at a publication and you know what the standard of fact checking is, be upfront with your sources at the very beginning of the process for what you think that fact checking process is going to be like. So, like for example, I write um, profiles for Business Insider pretty regularly. And these are like profiles of people's finances. Um, and I do all the fact checking myself. So I am very, very clear with people. I've done several profiles on people with long COVID and related complex chronic illnesses. I'm very clear at the beginning, like, hey, I'm interested in, you know, 
profiling you on your workplace accommodations, just so you know, I'm going to need to see a lot of really personal financial information from you, stuff like your pay stubs, your tax returns, you, you know, how much you pay in rent, you know, I get really clear with them, you know, how much you paid at that doctor visit, you know, whatever it is, that stuff is only going to be seen by me and my editor, it's not going to be published publicly, you know, just keeping in mind that not everyone has worked with a journalist before, and just being really clear, I know this is also going to be something that like is going to be a lot of effort for you. You're going to have to dig up all these documents. We're going to have to look through them together. So I just want to be really clear with you up front that that's something that we're going to have to do together. Do you still want to move forward with the story? And then also being clear about why you're asking and that this is a standard that happens for every single story, that it's not because you don't believe the person has long COVID. It's not because you believe people are out here trying to fake long COVID or fake stories of financial hardship for any reason. Um, just, I think of that context can go a long way in terms of fostering trust with sources. Now, I will say that I think, Sandia, you probably had a bit more luck connecting with people's doctors because I, I, I think people trust you a little bit more, probably because you yourself have experienced long COVID. I have heard you know, that the, there are patients who I think do not like being asked for that. And there are also doctors who are like, hell no, I'm not going to talk to a journalist or share records with a journalist. Um, so I think that one is a little bit trickier. And then, of course, you know, we also have to be mindful of the fact that I think that is appropriate in specific situations. It's it's not going to always be the way to verify that someone has long COVID because, of course, there are so many people who are struggling with these symptoms who don't have access to care or didn't get access to care early enough. So, you know, they might have some sort of medical record saying that, you know, they showed up two years after what they think is a COVID infection with, you know, chronic headaches. And if you as the journalist don't think that's going to be sufficient to kind of, you know, prove to your editor that this person is the source that they say that the person that they say they are, you know, may not be worth going down that that hole and kind of dredging up all of that information. So I think it's just, you know, in some ways it's a case by case basis and it's really worth just thinking about that. Um, I think the other thing is. I would, I agree with Sonia. I don't think people are really out here trying to fake this. I, I would be, um, I think a general rule is just to maybe be a little bit more cautious when there is a situation where you're interviewing someone who's like pushing something publicly that they stand to gain from financially. Um, that's not at all to say that patients who have GoFundMes or patients who are involved in advocacy organizations that are raising money shouldn't be interviewed or shouldn't be trusted. Not at all. That There's lots of people who are in that situation who are involved in mutual aid efforts. But obviously, if someone you know has a public profile where they're raising money, that's just something to take into account, right? They're, they're, again, I think that there's a belief that there's more people trying to fake illness than than actually there are because it's quite a difficult thing to do and not particularly fun, I don't think. Um, but just just to kind of keep that in mind. And I also always say that um, it's helpful to ask sources to recommend other sources. You know, the long COVID community um, is is large. It's also tight knit. And so um, in, in some ways, you know, you might hear the same names over and over again. And obviously, you want to get diverse sources. You want to get new sources. But people also, you know, may, ha may have just connected with someone who's newly disabled from long COVID who's looking to share their story. That's pretty common. And so getting those kind of referrals and recommendations can also be another way to kind of, you know, vet sources a little bit more, um, just get a better sense of, you know, kind of who is a trusted source in the community. Such a such a critical fine line to walk. That's um that's so so considerate. And um, thank you for sharing your insights and expertise, kind of behind the scenes about how all the magic happens. That's uh, really helpful. Um, so I know we're running a little short on time, and I've got two more questions from the audience that I really want to share with you. Um, the first is from Robert, who says, as a physician, I try to find effective therapy for my long COVID patients. However, all I read about is vaccines and virtually nothing about alternative medicine. Um, it feels like pharma runs the discourse. Um, it, how accurate, as folks who are actually in the media world, how accurate is that sentiment? Does pharma have a heavy influence in what gets written, or is it um, a perception that uh, that that is not that is not founded? Oh, and Cynthia, I'll, I'll give you that one first if you want to jump in. I saw you. Yeah, wow, that's a great question. Um, I don't feel like it's a media issue. I feel like it's a cultural United States Western medicine type issue. Um, and, you know, it was just, in fact, I was just talking about this earlier um, with someone who was in the pharma world, aka Ovet <laughs> from Solve, about how pharma actually hasn't been very involved at all when it comes to developing long COVID 
um, treatments. So they can't really push something that they're not actively involved in. And you know, there's a reason why that is. Uh, so really it has more to do with FD, not having any FDA treatments, FDA approved treatments. Um, it also has to do with lung COVID still not having a proper diagnostics tool or there's so much, <laughs> there's so much about, about lung COVID being new um, that's causing the lack of information, forward information on about treatments. I was actually surprised when I went on this uh, CDC, CDC um, website about when I when I dug into the CDC's websites about uh, recommended treatments for long COVID for that they are giving to for physicians um, and some of the treatments that they're saying like you know the Pepsid AC and the Zyrtex and those kind of things fall in line with what us patients have known for two years now uh, for for treating long COVID um, so those treatments do exist uh, I highly recommend you you look into the CDC's websites about that they have a whole tab for physicians on, on treating long COVID that I as a patient advocate agree that everything that they are recommending is on par, um, I don't think it's a media issue at all. It's 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 a cultural and and alternative medicine has been doing fantastic, phenomenal. Really helped me with my quality of life. By the way, um, I would recommend any physician to reach partner up with alternative medicine providers and to create that comprehensive care that's so needed to help get us our our uh, quality of life back. Thank you so much, Cynthia. That's really a, a, important insights. Um, Fee or Sandia, do you have any thoughts about um, kind of the role pharma has played in the discourse or in the role in the media so far? I mean, I'll just say that, I, you know, to write a story, especially you need a news hook often or you need a hook, right? To kind of, especially if you're writing about like potential treatments for long COVID and there are no FDA approved treatments and there aren't even really clinical trials for treatments going on, right? So when we see a study come out saying that, you know, Paxlovid might prevent long COVID, right, or might be effective in, in reducing symptoms. Again, a lot of the times the studies that are, you know, the preprints that are coming out are attached to, you know, pharmacological interventions more so than, say, acupuncture or something like that, right? We're not necessarily seeing a preprint on the efficacy of rest and pacing as a symptom management technique or, you know, the use of various herbs or something like that. So that might be more of why you're seeing, you know, those sorts of articles written. But frankly, I'm not seeing that many articles in general on uh, treatment options for long COVID right now. I think that's something we're all seeking out. Sandy, do you have anything to add to that or do you feel, no? Okay, no problem. Um, that's great because that gives us just enough time for our last question, um, which is how has long COVID impacted the representation of complex chronic illness more broadly? Has it been a legitimizing force? Has it raised awareness or has it had negative impacts on um, the broader conversation around these, these diseases? Um, Sandy, if you wanna jump in on that one first, um, and I'd love to hear from all three of you about this, um, this important issue. Well, I think it, um, in my perspective, I think it has further amplified a lot of the other complex illnesses. I think um, it has added to the discourse. I don't know that it's like, um, I think it, people are paying attention more to complex illnesses, I would say, but I also say that they're deeply misunderstood. And so I think there's like a fine line between the two, I would say. Um, I... Uh, but I would, uh, what I would say is that there's also a lot of, uh, misconceptions <laughs> about complex diseases still. And I think that's always going to persist sadly. Um, um, and I, uh, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that there is a, um, I'm not entirely sure that I have the answer for that. I'm sorry. Um, no, it's all right. That's why we ask the hard questions to kind of explore the difficulties there. But um, but overall, you're saying that there has been an increase in awareness as a result of long COVID. Well, I think I think so. I think that like from a patient perspective and from at least the amount of response that I've received from like writing about long COVID, I think that like there are people that are aware of it and are, um, but I'm, I still feel like the the awareness isn't fully there. Um, and so I never want to say, yeah, for sure, long COVID has like amplified all of this. I will say that like, I am not a health reporter. And so prior to writing about COVID and dealing with 
uh, long COVID myself, I did not cover um, healthcare and the health system. And so to me, it was very new. Um, and so I also am coming from a place of bias of that is my experience. And so I do want to acknowledge that like, uh, that might not be the case, of course, for folks that have been living with complex illnesses for, for years. Um, so. Um, Fee, do you have any thoughts to add on um, on the kind of impact of long COVID um, on our perception of these diseases? I mean, I think similar to Sonia, I also, you know, I, I was not as aware of a lot of these diseases as I should have been before the pandemic. So I feel like I'm not, I'm not that good at judging how things have progressed. You know, I, I would like to think that there's better cultural understandings of chronic illness, of the liminal space between, you know, wellness and recovery and illness um, than there was before the pandemic due to, you know, the stories that journalists like Ed Young and others have written. Um, I do think that there is also some weird stuff happening, like some weird kind of backlash to um, the progress that's been made. I think that you know, as a result of the work that's been done by, you know, patients, people with ME-CFS and, and patients and people with long COVID um, really getting involved and in trying to correct the record. Um, we are seeing a, a kind of odd, you know, I think it's minor, but an odd media backlash that's sort of attempting to say that things have gone too far in that direction and that we're listening almost too much to patients and too much to the patient perspective. Megan O'Rourke referenced that uh, New York Magazine article um, and the way that it kind of tries to, you know, describe advocacy as not science based. Um, and, you know, I think that's something that happens from time to time, right, when things, when there sort of starts to be an effort to course correct, um, people who are comfortable with the status quo uh, respond negatively toward that and uh, feel like things have gone too far when I think many of us feel like, well, we're actually only just starting. Um, I, I also think that there um, has been, you know, a, a bizarre conversation taking place about mental health and long COVID um, that really sort of treats treats these issues in vacuums um, and and uh, and almost tries to assume that because long COVID advocates are are trying to uh, clarify that long COVID is not caused by mental illness, that that you know people with long COVID uh, stigmatize mental illness when you know, many people with long COVID, myself included, have experienced mental illness. I mean, prior to developing long COVID, I actually wrote a lot more and spoke a lot more about destigmatizing mental illness. And uh, that kind of lens of journalism was much more my world. And so I often feel like the conversations that are taking place um, around long COVID and mental health are almost taking place, uh, you know, when they're coming from that skeptical point of view. Um, that long haulers are rejecting this psychosomatic hypothesis on the basis of, of you know, uh, stigmatizing mental health. That they're they're coming from this vacuum that doesn't acknowledge like all the other progress that has been made with regard to destigmatizing mental health. I mean, I would much 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 rather uh, you know state that that I I have anxiety um, and that I've experienced depression. I think that's a much more socially acceptable thing for me in my life to talk about with my friends than it is to talk about the fact that I have long COVID. So I still feel like those conversations have not fully merged. And to me, it feels a bit like a generational thing. I'm 28. Um, being mentally ill is not something that feels super stigmatized in my specific like cultural environment right now. Um, but I, I do feel like that is something that has kind of been, you know, attempted to, to be put upon us. So, so those are concerns I have. I would love to see that conversation merged a little bit more. Um, but overall, I, I do think that it's, you know, that, that in the same way that patients are kind of changing the approach to research um, uh, in terms of meaningful involvement, I do hope that health journalism, you know, has been changed in some major ways. Um, and I've talked to journalists who, you know, are not reporting on long COVID, but who cite the long COVID and the patient-led long COVID movement as really changing their perspective on, on what can be gained from, uh, from listening to patients with lived experience and really centering those lived experiences uh, in stories like this. So that gives me hope. That's amazing. I'm so thank you for sharing that. That gives me hope as well. And, um, and on that note, Cynthia, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add to that question? Yeah, wow. Um, it's so interesting to, he to hear the different perspectives. Just I feel like as a person of color, we still have the huge, huge uh, stigma of talking about mental health issues. And um, that's one of the things that drive me as an advocate. Some of you know, I lost my sister and to her lack of being able to endure the struggle of mental health um, from becoming chronically ill. And it, had she felt more comfortable 
discussing her difficulties, she would still be here today. And so that's one of the things that I took with me when I was in the hospital um, in the first wave by myself with no visitors um, as a very mentally strong person that had a, a relative that lost that battle and why even on my sick days, I try really, really hard to be present in the media because I know that that stigma is so strong. <laughs> it is so strong, even with other advocates that I know that are comfortable talking about their struggles with um, the physical part of long COVID. A lot of them do not want to talk about the mental struggles that they, you know, they'll just confide with me about it. Or a lot of people don't want to be in the media because um, they don't want to talk about the mental struggles. And so it's interesting to see the difference. I definitely feel like this is also a generational difference happening as well. But from my experience, especially in the Black community, mental health is still such a stigma that is keeping people of color from wanting to be in the media about long COVID, whether or not they're talking about that as well. So um, yeah, it's it's interesting to see the different experiences, but I think that's why it's so important for the media to report on a variety of people with a variety of backgrounds to see what's similar and then what's very different and what is pushing it. But I do believe wholeheartedly that long COVID is pushing um, mental health stigma and pushing um, chronic illness stigma in the right direction that is so needed and conversations that were never going to happen before are happening. And I've learned personally a lot. Um, I've been able to reach out to a, a friend of mine who's had lupus for as long as I can remember. And I'm like, oh my God, this is what you've been living with your whole life. I had no idea. I had no idea. Like I, I looked to her as if she's like, an amazing, she is an amazing person, but like I have so much respect for her now more um, because I understand it. And now I also feel like I should have done more prior to this experience and, and educating myself about um, chronic illness as well. So I do think like we're going in the right direction. Thank you. I, I, I agree. I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. I think this conversation is one of the many things that's pushing us in the right direction. So thank you all so much. Um, we are at time. Cynthia, Fiona, Sandia, thank you so much for a fascinating discussion and spending time with the GIC and Solve communities. As a reminder to our guests, this event is recorded and you will be able for, to replay through the GIC website. Um, our program series will conclude um, our very last episode or our very last executive brief briefing will take place on December 20th, um, talking about long COVID and technology. Technology. Registration will be open at the GIC's website at www.interdependence.org. And I'd like to once again take us take a moment to extend our thanks um, and sincerest gratitude to our program sponsor, Responsum, for Long COVID, for supporting our series. Um, and as we conclude, we encourage you to take 30 seconds to respond to our audience survey. It'll pop up on your screen when you close the window. Your feedback is so important to us, and we appreciate you letting us know how we can improve our programming. Thank you again for joining us today, and have a wonderful rest of your week, and happy holidays. Thank you.